Okay, so we're getting started in uh, imagery analysis. This is the, the, for the last project, project four in our class. And um, this is the uh, description of the project here. And what we're going to do this time is actually take a step outside of GIS land and we're going to look at qualitative imagery analysis. And we talked about whether you wanted to learn about how to use ImageJ slash Fiji or if you want to do this in something a little bit more user friendly like GIMP. Um, so what we're going to do is to follow along with part one pretty much. Um, and we're going to use GIMP to do some qualitative imagery analysis, just some enhancement of a few drone photos uh, from this same project area in uh, southern Italy uh, that you used for project one and that we will use for the remainder of project four. So in this particular uh, section, you'll want to download this Calabria imagery.zip file. You know, it's just a zip file and downloaded it to your uh, hard drive somewhere. And it uh, doesn't particularly matter where, just as long as you can find it. And you just right click and um, extract here and it will create a folder called Calabria images. And inside uh, Calabria images, uh, for some reason it's loading, loading for me, will be I believe for images. Why is it loading, loading, loading? Let's see what's happening on my computer. Okay, my poor little office machine here is so busy recording video showing my face and trying to <laughs> display, uh, um, you know, files in here. Anyway, so these ones with the preference DJI are um, vertical aerial photos taken with uh, DJI. Uh, drone and then this one called Los Quicho Plaque is a, a oblique photo with just a, a standard mirrorless camera of a, 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 a date plaque on an aqueduct. So what you'll want to do is to start up uh, the GIMP or you know it may say GNU image manipulation program which is what GIMP is short for and I've already got it started up here and it should look like this and the simplest way you to get bit into it you could go to file open and then find but uh, literally, you can drag and drop, and you can actually drag and drop all four of them at once, and it will open them as separate tabs across the top. So these are the four images. So here you can see these are oblique, I'm not oblique, vertical drone photos over some of these um, farm uh, structures that we've been recording. These are historic from the, some of them date to the late, uh, 19th century, maybe even a little earlier, all the way through the early 20th century. And they're in various states of repair. They include houses. This is one of the wells, uh, barns, this kind of stuff. And then this is the date plaque that's taken at oblique because it was kind of up the wall and you know at a distance, so I used a zoom lens. And uh, we can use various qualitative techniques to just enhance the features of interest. And remember the whole point of this, pretty much all imagery analysis, is to uh, increase the signal to noise ratio. And of course the signal is whatever we're interested in. And if we're really interested in plants and grass, then we would want to boost that signal and reduce everything else. But in our case, we're archeologists, so we're interested in this built environment. We want to enhance those uh, features and maybe even reduce or eliminate some of these other features. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just to go through a basic routine to just make the image look a little nicer. Let's say you wanted to include this for a publication or something like that. So we wanna balance the range of tones to get the maximum sort of range from black to white uh, in terms of luminance values and to balance some of the colors and a few other things just to make this image look a little bit pleasing. You know, this was taken, uh, I usually flew the drone as close to noon as possible to eliminate long shadows when I'm taking these, these kinds of vertical images, but there's still some shadows in there. And you know, the lighting conditions change and the, the, what we call the white balance or the color temperature may not be bright. So it may look a little too yellow or a little too blue or something like that. And then we might wanna just adjust some of the greens and all of this other stuff. So what I will do is introduce some very simple automatic tools and you know that may be where you stop for this kind of thing and then I'll show you how to do it a little bit more manually. So what I'm going to do, um, you can see the difference in the sort of color temperature. This is a more neutral color balance, white balance, and this one is definitely more yellow. 
Um, also, what we can do is to look at the spread of the values uh, from dark to light and see if we can equalize that. So I'm going to show you the automatic way to do that. It's under the color menu at the top, auto, and you can hit equalize, and that's going to stretch the colors, and you may like that. In this case, I hate it, so I'm going to hit control Z, or I can go to um, undo over here in the edit menu. And I'll go down to the next one, and I'll pick the stretch contrast, which should, uh, when I click OK, stretch the values to maximum brightness and maximum black should fit the histogram to the left and right. This will make sense when I show you the manual way. Didn't seem to do too much in my case here, but OK. And uh, colors auto, let's try color enhance. And that actually sort of made it a little bit too yellow, so I'm going to hit Control Z on that. And then we can go to color uh, white auto white balance, and that's an improvement in, for my eye. Everything still looks a little bit too bright and you know maybe a little too contrasty. So the auto tools kind of got us started, but we're going to want to uh, follow up almost always with some manual adjustments. Um, so I always recommend start with the auto tools, and if they do enough for you, then you can stop. If not, let's go into some of the manual tools which are up here. Now as with everything, there are multiple interfaces that allow you to basically achieve the same thing. Um, and when we're looking at just the range of luminance values, we got exposure, shadow highlights, brightness contrast, levels, and curves. And it all depends on what's more intuitive for you. The basic one is exposure, which lets you uh, change the black level, and you can actually see the shadows are kind of washed out when I put it down, and they get really black when I pull it up. And then the general exposure is setting sort of the, the overall brightness as if you turn the exposure compensation up in your camera. Now, I find this a little too simplistic, so I, I almost never use that tool. Um, a little bit more complex would be the shadow highlights tool, which gives you control over the shadows and highlights independently without kind of washing the thing out. I can turn the shadow brightness up a little bit, so I see a little bit more detail in the shadows. And I could, um, you know, if the highlights here are looking a little washed out, I could kind of dial them down a little bit, and I can recover a little bit more detail in the shadows. Now, in terms of like a, like a photograph, this may not look great because the rest of this image is kind of weird, but we're interested in this building, so I'm just sort of focusing on getting as much detail out of the stuff that I, that I, as I can in this. So, you know, I may want to push it more than I would if I was being artistic. And of course, you can brighten it up with the white point adjustment uh, if you wanted to as well, or darken it down that way. So that tool could be the one that you choose to use. I'm just going to cancel what I did right now, um, even though I was pretty happy actually with the way that looks, because I want to show you uh, a couple others. Brightness contrast is more like a, fairly similar to the exposure tool. It's really simplistic. It just brightens it up and then increases or decreases the contrast. You know, that might be enough. I tend not to use it because it's too simplistic for most of my purposes. So I tend to go right into these two, the levels and the curves. And usually what I do is I set the levels first. So what I'm going to do is to go to File, and uh, what I'm going to do is, um, where is my uh, reset? It used to be under here. Give me two seconds. Maybe it's under Edit. Uh, so I'm just going to undo everything that I did, all the automatic stuff, because I want you to see what the histogram of the luminous values looked like to begin with. So I did, undid everything back to the beginning, and now I'm going to go to the Levels tool, and you can see this is the histogram, and we're used to histograms now, of brightness values from black, 255 white, to zero black, right? This is an 8-bit JPEG, so those are the the values. And again, we're just looking at the luminance, but we could look at the red luminance independently, the green luminance independently, or the blue luminance independently, or the collective value of all of them. Now, what we see here is with the black value, the darkest value in the image is pretty close to our zero. So we can just take this little black uh, triangle and move it up just to the end here. 
and but the brightest value, uh, the brightest white value in our photograph is actually pretty far from the value of 255. So we can drag this little white triangle to the end of the histogram and now we are stretching the values that were recorded by the sensor to the total range of values available in the container, the, J, the 8 bit JPEG from 0 to 255. Um, you can do it like I did here. You can stretch it on the output, but it's more intuitive just to do this. And so if I hit OK, now we have an image where all the values that were recorded by the sensor are occupying all of our possible values for luminance between 0 and 255. So we've got data in every possible bucket and that allows us to get a little bit more detail in some of these areas that might be compressed um, if we hadn't done that. Now I mentioned again the levels tool you can look at uh, you can look at for example by just by color and again remember all color images are composited multi-band images so we can treat the reds uh, band separate from the blue band separate from the green band and we can do the same kind of deal in terms of squashing the values of red in the highlights and in the shadows by moving around our uh, our levels you know whether it's from the output or the input and that will change the color temperature and the color balance if we do it that way and again we can go red we can go to the green values and we can balance them you know that way if we want I guess I should uh, maybe reset the reds and then check out the blue so we can histogram stretch all of them and we'll get an enhanced color kind of rendering out of that as well so actually that looks all pretty good now I like to use the levels just to set the sort of endpoints because it's a little bit more intuitive Messing around with luminance values in the middle of the histogram, I prefer to use this curves tool. Now at first this may seem a little bit strange to you, but let me explain how this works. So here's our histogram as before, just sort of shown, uh, sort of faded in the background. And again we have value, red, green, and blue. So we can go total luminance, just the red channel, just the green channel, or just the blue channel. Then we have this uh, slanted line and we have a x-axis and a y-axis. We basically have input uh, tones from black to white and our output tones from black to white. If we leave this line straight, it's a linear regression one-to-one -one, uh, input x equals output y. So value in equals value out. If we change the shape of this line by pulling it in some way, usually creating a curve of some kind, we are changing the regression between the input x and the output rendering y. Now what we did with um, the levels, we could technically do here by moving the black point and, and moving the white point up or down these axes, but I find it just a little bit more intuitive to do it first with the levels, just compress that range, and then I use the curves to sort of mess with the shape of the histogram in between those two endpoints. Um, so if I pull the line from a straight uh, diagonal to this kind of curve with a bump in the middle, that's equivalent to brightening up mostly the midtone, so you get a brighter image. If I pull it down below the original diagonal, it's akin to darkening up those midtones. So depending on how the light is hitting the scene, uh, I may want to do one or the other of those. Very often you want to give a little bumpness and brightness uh, in the midtones. Here we don't really need too much. What we might need is to pull the shadows up a little bit. So I would grab down here in the dark area and I would take those blacks and if we move this up, we're moving up in terms of the luminum. So we're taking something that's a little darker in the shadows and we're gonna and the output make it a little brighter and so you can actually see all of these shadows are kind of increasing in, in terms of the detail you're able to see and the same deal with the white values over here if I pull them up I'm gonna make them even brighter but if I pull it down I'm gonna make the the whitish or the lightish values a little darker and that might increase a little clarity of the details now you may need to kinda of get in there and find the right point above which 
or below which you want to be messing with, depending on where the values uh, lie in that histogram that you're trying to, you know, uh, play around with. So you can have a pretty complex curve here, and you can move the points around until you're kind of happy with the overall contrast, like so. Now, in general, what I've done by pushing like this and pulling like this, I've actually reduced the contrast in this image. So if I have this curve that goes the way that you're looking at it here, I am reducing contrast, but I'm actually gaining some, some detail that I couldn't see in the shadows. Um, on the other hand, I could pull this way and push that way, and in that case I'd be increasing the contrast, the, the starkness between the absolute black and the absolute white, and that might be important for one image or another. In my case here, I liked to the result where I was sort of reducing the contrast a little bit in terms of the clarity of what I actually wanted to see. So we're just going to click OK here. And now we have a good range of tones. The image is a little lackluster. Maybe we want to increase some of the detail. So we may want to go to um, some of our filters over here. And uh, what we can do is to let's see where is uh, I always often forget exactly where some of this stuff is uh, where is my sharpness that's that's blurring enhance ah there it is sorry I was looking at it and I literally couldn't see it uh, sharpening with an unsharp mask and in this particular case what we're going to do is to increase the micro contrast um, particularly we want to do it at sort of the edges where the colors or the tones change a lot and you're going to want to play around with this and uh, you know normally if you're doing this for artistic purposes you don't want to really kind of blow the like if I really increase like this would be a terrible looking photo but in terms of enhancing what we're looking for in terms of pattern analysis you know we might want to blow the sharpness all the way out you know uh you know not all the way out but somewhere higher than before because we're not looking for an art necessarily an artistic rendering but one that enhances the patterns so a little bit of increasing the radius and the amount and then um, if we only wanted to, to apply it to just the edges we would increase the threshold and we could click OK. So in this particular case we're pretty good. I'm going to go one last thing to the color, color temperature and uh, I am going to uh, actually reduce this value a little bit so what we're going to do is take the original yellowish color balance and create it a little bit more towards the blue end so that the image overall doesn't look quite so blue. So. There we go. I'm pretty happy with this for a basic enhancement of the image. I will go now to File, Export As, and I will put this as uh, Color Enhanced. And this is just going to save out a new JPEG, like so. Export. And if I wanted to save you know, all the steps, I would go to File, I'll just do Save As, and here you can see color enhanced.xcf. That's a GIMP uh, format just to save. Here's the original image. Here's all the stuff I've done with it. And again, it's not technically an image file like a JPEG or a TIFF, but it lets you get back into the GIMP right where you basically left off. Okay. So that's one possible way to enhance the sort of before and after. And uh, another uh, routine that you might want to do is to uh, really just go to town to pull out the architectural features and separate them from from the background. So in this case what we're going to do is something called thresholding or creating a binary black and white image and uh, the best way to do that, the simplest way to do that with a color photo is to go to the colors threshold tool. And when you first open it up, you're going to be like, whoa, what happened to my image? But you can basically see what we're taking is the full range of luminance and color and we're shifting that to just black or just white, zero or one, okay? 
And we have a very similar tool to the levels tool, but basically what we're doing is putting our uh, cutoff points, just like as if we're doing a Boolean statement in GIS, but we're moving from the white values or the bright values and the dark values, and we're saying anything above or below or within this zone is going to be black, anything outside of it is going to be white, for example. Um, and in our case here, so it actually shows black and white, right, on the histogram. So if we don't want to deal with any of the dark things, we put that threshold all the way to zero, and then we only move from the bright values in until we get, look at that, this building is pretty bright, so we're, we did already pretty good right there. Uh, on the other hand, if we only wanted dark things, we'd put the white triangle all the way to the left or right, and we'd only pull from the left until we got the dark thing. So here's the interior of the building and some of the vegetation. And as before, we can uh, decide if we want to do it with the full range of luminance values or just work with one of the color channels or you know the color channels kind of independently. Here I'm pulling over from the red until I get about like so. And uh, we can see, you know, looking at the greens, we can look at those as well. And we could also be looking at the blues when we do it like so. So it all kind of depends on your goal. It looks like for me, I'm pretty happy with uh, the way the blue is kind of doing it over here. And it's okay if you have a little bit here, because I'll show you how to filter some of the little finer details out. So you want to pick a threshold that gets enough of the area that you're interested in, but not too much of the the extraneous little bits so that they're easier to kind of filter out. So that's, you know, for doing it really quickly, that seems okay to me. So I'll click OK, and we'll go to our filters, and uh, we'll go to, um, where is it? Uh, well, we could do a noise. Uh, that's actually creating noise, but where is the... Um, okay, dilate and erode. Okay, so technically, dilate is uh, supposed to take... for This works for binary image. It takes wherever there's black and grows it by a pixel, and erode takes wherever there's black and shrinks it by a pixel. But for whatever reason, for years and years, in GIMP, the two have been transposed in this generic. So dilate actually erodes and erode actually dilates. I don't know why it's been stuck like that for years, but that's the way it is. So I'll click dilate and you'll see some of the little areas will disappear. And you can do that um, again and again. And it, but remember every time you do that, it's gonna eat away at your details. So I'm gonna hit control Z to get back. One dilate was pretty good. Um, and if I hit, uh, you know, so dilate is actually eroding again. And if I hit erode, I'm going to dilate, so I'm going to grow back some of those areas. So one thing to do is to kind of go back and forth between them, uh, erode, and then dilate. Kind of shrink and grow, shrink and grow, and you'll get rid of some of these little areas. And now it's fairly straightforward. You can pick some of these selection tools. Here's the sort of lasso and I can just sort of draw around the area that I'm interested in, like so. Uh, close that loop. So I've selected inside here, and I can select, uh, I can invert, and that will select everything outside, and I can literally hit the delete key, and everything else outside there is gone. And, you know, if I was being careful, I could sort of zoom in, you know, a little bit closer, like so. And uh, again, invert the selection, and then hit delete, and everything is gone. So look at that. Um, and then I can go back to selection and um, deselect everything. And you know what? I'm pretty good here. I can even uh, pick up a brush if I wanted to, or the pencil tool, um, oops, like so. And I could go in here and just sort of paint over any last little bits with white. And in the end, I can have a really nice black and white image of just the structure that I was into. Okay, so that's great if I want to do this in black and white. Is there a way to select out features and keeping the whole thing in color? Well, there is, and uh, we have to use um, 
some of these selection tools over here. And we have a couple of them. Uh, so we can uh, sort of get the party started by just cropping in uh, with the crop tool and just hit enter. And now we've gotten rid of, you know, a bunch of the image. So this is a, a well. And let's say I just want to select the, the you know, these stones area. So first I'm going to cut out, you know, the, the wash and everything that's mostly similarly colored just to make my life a little easier. And then I can try this select by color tool. And again, I have a few uh, things that I can use, but let's just see. Oh, okay. Let's increase the threshold and, uh, you know, the shift control A deselects again. So let's, I mean, be a little bit more selective in my color choices. So I'll keep changing the threshold lower and lower until I get somewhere in, uh, in there. I can maybe do it easier if I use these little arrows. And so, you know, you can play around with that. And again, you can choose just to select by red, green, or blue if you wanted to as well. And maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. So that's one tool that you can uh, do. And again, uh, select none is the easiest way. And that might be useful. In this particular case, we got a lot of these similar colors, so it's not really doing it. You can try uh, fuzzy select like so, in which case it will try to automatically pick contiguous areas. And again, you have your threshold here. And uh, you know what you can do is hold down, oops, hold down the shift key, and as you add more selection, it will add to the current selection. So if I do one, if I increase my threshold like so, and I hold down the shift, I'm adding right to it as I go along. So maybe that does it, but again, sometimes you have issues like this. So is there a better way? And in fact, there is a better way. And I got to find it. We have, ooh, right, we have uh, the foreground select tool. Oh, we also have the scissor select, which tries to find an edge, you know, as you go around like so. So maybe the scissor select will find the edges. But in this particular case, you know, I probably it's not going to do a real good job. So instead, I, I'm right clicking, by the way, to get these alternatives. I'm going to use foreground select. And uh, I'm just going to undo my selection. And what I'm going to do is to, because I want to get these stones, I'm going to draw a loose sort of uh, general, like this is the area that I'm interested in having my automatic classification you know, look in. And then once I do that, uh, hit enter and that's anything in blue we're going to ignore and then uh, what we're going to do is so paint oops we're going to paint over the areas that we're interested in and it's going to try and find similar things but only within the area that I'm really kind of interested in so in this particular case it's struggling a little bit because again we have a lot of uh, you know, similar colors. So um, you may need to switch from drawing the foreground to drawing the background and saying, hey, ignore this. And maybe we need to make our, uh, you know, pen a little bit bigger here. Ignore these colors like so. Um, often it does a little bit better when we're trying to do this kind of thing initially. But basically, you're trying to tell it what you're interested in and what you're not interested in. And then let it kind of smartly choose the areas that you are interested in. And let's see. It's not doing a wonderful job here because there's not a ton of separation between the background colors and the foreground colors. But let's see what it does. And we'll hit select and and we'll chug along and do its thing. It may take a little while, so I'm going to pause. Okay, so this is the selection that it came up with. In this particular case, it did not do a very good job. But in other cases, um, you know, for example, where the, the, the feature is a little bit more 
distinct. So let's just say we want to select the roof of this structure like so. I'm just going to draw my basic rough outline. Um, hit enter. And I'm going to draw the foreground. I'll increase the size of my pen so it just makes it a little bit faster. And uh, draw especially over these red tiles like so. The idea is just to give it a good sample of what you're interested in. And uh, hopefully it should uh, sort of take that in. And then, you know, I can do a little bit better about what I'm sort of not interested in, like so. And over here as well. And uh, in this particular case, we can hit enter. I'll pause again because it takes a couple minutes. It's sort of calculated, and you can see it did a pretty good job just finding the roof. So we can select it, and again, we will uh, invert the selection so it's selecting everything except the roof, and then we can hit delete, and everything else is gone. Uh, in this particular case, I have a nice still color rendering of the roof. And of course, you know, it's not 100% perfect. We could spend a little more time and refine it. And if we had, for example, a, like a, a artifact photo on a white background, this will work really well. So you got a little uh, lithic object or a piece of uh, pottery or something like that. Yeah, this back uh, foreground select tool is like the go-to for that. Okay, so the final thing I want to do is to show you just how to increase... Um, you know, like uh, the, the visibility of patterns in an image. In this case, we have this oblique photo of this plaque that has a date on it. It's a little hard to read because A, it was written in cursive, B, it was kind of far away, C, it's kind of old, right? Um, it's a little hard to see. Is that 1913, 1918, 1988? You know, <laughs> what's the deal over here? So the first thing I want to do is to also uh, correct some of the perspective because this was up at a distance and I was shooting at an angle so you know I couldn't get a straight on shot of this plaque so what I will do there's a variety of ways to do this um, but let me find the, the right tool uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. warp transform I believe is the one that I want to do and uh, actually no what is it cage transform I think is the one that I want to do and so here um, I can, oops, sorry, I accidentally <laughs> clicked. I can click, uh, oops, zoom. oh boy, let me just zoom back out like so. Okay, what I can do is click Cage Transform and I can draw I think I can draw lines like so. And I'm going to pause while it does its thing. Okay, so the cage has now been computed. And I, sh I guess I should have said what you're doing is drawing a, um, like a skeleton. And then it gives you handles and you can pull on it to shift the shape of it. So that's what it does. So now that we've given it the skeleton for the area that we're interested in, I can manually pull on some of these areas. And again, it's going to take time to calculate every time. And of course, I made the mistake of accidentally clicking here. <laughs> I should have just clicked on the corners to make my life a little bit easier. Um, but it will warp the image as it's doing this. So I'm going to pause, I'll let it do its thing, and I'll show you the, uh, the result of it. But um, this tool, the Cage Transform, is useful for doing complex warping, but as you can see, it takes some time. Um, so, you know, what I might actually do is stop this because this is not a complex I'm warping. If I had a lot of barrel distortion or something, that might be one thing. But here, I just literally need to shift it. And instead, I'm going to use a different uh, transform tool called the Handle Transform tool. So just let me pause until this thing is done, and then uh, I'll switch over to the other tool. Okay, so uh, Cage Transform, uh, it, was, it did that. You can see here, because I just pulled the one corner down. So you can see it could do something really cool if you take the time to work with it, but it's slow. So let's go over here to the one that says, I, I misspoke, I meant 
uh, you, well, okay, there's multiple transform tools, unified transform, handle transform, shear, uh, flip, etc., rotate. You could use any number of these. Let's start uh, with the basic uh, handle transform, in which case um, you can sort of grab it and spin it and zoom it. It's a little bit weird, uh, like so. So you could mess around with that by pulling, like if you grab it in the corner, you can see how you can pull it. And oh, you grab it in that corner and you pull it up here. So it, it's like it takes definitely takes some, some getting used to. You know, you gotta, ah. So you can just sort of undo it. So put a point in a place where you wanna pull it. You do one, it doesn't do much. You do two and then you can start to rotate you do three and then you can start to shear it from side to side and you do four and you can start to pull it front and back like so. So it all depends on what you want to do. I'm just going to hit control Z to get us back. So I like to put one, two, rotate, three and shear it. And that's usually about enough for most of the perspective distortions over there. So I actually uh, uh, like the handle transform quite a bit. It really does it fairly simply and it's pretty powerful. You can look into some of these other things. The unified transform kind of does the similar thing here. But I'm pretty happy with this. So uh, I'll hit transform and we'll actually calculate it. And now I can grab my crop tool and I can kind of crop out the rest of the uh, image. Just hit enter and everything's gone. And now let's focus on enhancing some of this stuff here. So um, you can do all of the same stuff we were doing before. Um, with the levels, you can start to uh, increase some of the contrast. And then you can play around with this middle guy over here to, uh, you know, push some of the lighter values to the light, lighter side of it, like so, until you get a little bit of an improvement over here. And again, you can mess around with the different color channels. So you could uh, reduce the reds if they seem to be, you know, the color patterns seem to be messing with your ability to interpret what's going on. So you could do it that way. You could use the curves tool you could use some of the contrast tool and this kind of stuff. Um, but you could also fool around with some of these filters. You could run uh, sharpening on this guy to the point where it would be really awful to look at for a, you know, for a normal image. And if you increase the threshold, you'll, you'll sharp, the sharpening areas will get bigger. But maybe, uh, maybe that actually enhances the edge that you're actually interested in. So it looks terrible in terms of a photograph, but you're actually able to see the distinction between what's writing and what's not. So that actually did something right there. Uh, play around with that until it looks like, oh, I can see the pattern. That's one way. We could run uh, an edge detection. Uh, there's a variety of different ones that you can run. Uh, just do the default edge detection and change change the thresholds, uh, change the algorithm, change the behavior at the border, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, playing around with these values until you find, hey, look, there we go. Now I can see the edges pretty well. And uh, you can choose different, you know, methods, you know, Laplacian, differential, etc., until you find one that looks kind of cool. So you can do that. Uh, you can find even some of these artistic ones uh, might actually help. So where's the emboss? Uh, so I always got to remember where some of this stuff is. Um, well, you can look for some of these other things. I'm looking particularly for the embossing. That might help. Oh, you know, another thing that you might want to do is to actually blur the image because sometimes the detail is kind of getting in your way. And so if we render it so it looks a little bit out of focus, in some cases, 
we can actually see the broader pattern a little bit more than if we leave all that detail in here. So in this particular case, it kind of helps me sort of see the sh actual shape of these numbers, you know, depending on the amount of blur that you put in compared to, uh, you know, the original kind of noisy-ish part of it as well. So anyway, you can play around with some of these things. Uh, maybe it was this one I was looking at earlier, Cartoonify, where it literally drew lines. Yeah, this is the one I was looking at. Let's just see what it looks like in its default. It's going to chug through. It's literally going to turn this photograph into what it looks like a, you know, like a cartoon. And so in that case, it actually enhanced some of these areas. And I, you know, I thought that, hey, that was pretty neat. So, you know, play around with some of these non-standard uh, techniques. And you can always undo when you're done with it, like so. And again, remember that Save As saves the XCF file, which gets you back to where you're going. But export as exports a JPEG of what you're currently looking at. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you could do in GIMP. Uh, we haven't even messed with layers and changing the blending between them or increasing the dynamic range with multiple exposures. You could do a whole bunch of stuff in GIMP. It's like Photoshop, basically. But I've showed you some basic techniques to do some just qualitative moving some sliders around until you get the, the signal that you're kind of looking for. Uh, basic qualitative image enhancement in GIMP with the purpose of increasing signal to noise. In the case for us, it's pattern as opposed to making pretty images. So hopefully that makes some sense. And yeah, that's the first part of project four.